Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the first episode of Barbarians. I am JD, and joining me is my brother, barbarian brother, you might say, Noel. <laughs> yeah, you, you do it better than I do. <laughs> I've been practicing. Who knew we would have a donkey beret? I had no idea. You know, the great action one-liners, like, I'll be back, yippee Kaye, motherfucker, and... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the only films to have perfected the art of the Donkey Bray are this and the lead character from Revenge of the Nerds when he laughs. Yeah, I was wondering if this was some sort of like inside joke or what's going on, but I'm sure we'll get to it in a moment. Yeah. We'll be discussing the films of the Barbarian Brothers. Yes. This is a project that, Noel, you've been wanting to work on for a while, if I understand this correctly, right? Oh, yes, with many other hosts, but I eventually settled on you. Yep, I am, what, your bronze medal, tin, copper, something? You're the pink star. Okay, I can live with that. Because we ran out of gold. <laughs> but no, in all honesty, I wanted to do this as a podcast between bros. You're my bro, JD. Yeah, not actual brothers, but no. we are spiritual brothers, and that's good enough. Right. We have a lot of similar tastes, and so I couldn't imagine doing this with anyone else. Yeah, you're my brother from another individual. <laughs> If you're just joining us, we discuss the Barbarian Brothers in another podcast that this is spinning off from. We should know this is an official spinoff of Schumacast. Yes. This is like a mid-season summer special. <laughs> if you're just listening to this episode, we did discuss them in our previous discussion of DC Cab, which you did with your regular Schumacast co-host, Angie, and I joined in there. Yes. So technically, the DC Cab episode of Schumacast is technically part one of this series. But it's a supporting role for the Barbarian Brothers. And what we are doing in this miniseries is exploring their feature lead roles, where they were the stars. There are many, many hundreds, some might even say, by those who can't count. They were spread across an entire marquee. Yeah. <laughs> they are very wide men. Yes. They're not super prolific, but they do make for it in muscle mass, and that's something. And, you know, we had fun doing it on Schumacast, and I've kind of always toyed with the idea of exploring more of the Barbarian Brothers because they're just so funny. So I was like, right while Schumacast is taking a little pause between decades, why not just slip in a little mini series here? Four episodes, get them in and out quick. Yeah, and I was excited to join in. I've only seen one film with them previous to this. Which film was it? Double Trouble, I Ooh. believe. I'm looking forward to revisiting that one. And the only one that I had seen in full is the one we're discussing tonight, The Barbarians. Yeah. So, no, why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of The Barbarians? So, The Barbarians, David Paul and Peter Paul were born in 1957, Connecticut. Rowdy kids, they had severe dyslexia, severe hyperactivity, got in all kinds of trouble. And it wasn't until like around high school that both of them started getting into sports, wrestling and football and all that stuff. And it actually wasn't until their 20s that they got into bodybuilding as a way to deal with their hyperactivity. But not only was it a way to combat that, but they got super into bodybuilding. <laughs> like within three years, they became what we see in DC Cap. Oh, jeez. And what's fascinating about them is they were not competitive bodybuilders. They never competed in any bodybuilding competitions. These were just guys who built this reputation around the gyms for they would literally come and just pump iron 10 hours every day. While a lot of people are about, you know, sculpting a physique and getting cut for appearances sake, they were genuinely interested in weightlifting and would also exercise areas of their bodies that most other bodybuilders wouldn't like their necks. That's why their necks are thicker than their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, they got to a point where at their prime, they could, I think it was reverse grip bench press 500 pounds Jeez. and single arm curls of 300 pounds per arm. 
So I mean, these guys were serious. They were, again, they weren't about the competition. They weren't about the appearance. They just wanted to lift as heavy of things as they could. <laughs> and that led to them, again, becoming these little cult figures in the bodybuilding industry. And this led to them becoming an exhibition, becoming basically like a weightlifting stage show where they would tour around, show off all their weightlifting, impress people, challenge local records and all that stuff. And they gradually became these media personalities and would pop up in commercials and on talk shows and all that stuff. And DC Cab in 1983 was their first real big breakout. Sadly, the two Barbarian Brothers haven't really done that many interviews, so I don't really know much of the history from their perspective. Sadly, again, DC Cab, I haven't found much from Joel's perspective, so I didn't hear about like how he learned of them, why he incorporated them into the story. Suffice it to say, they made an impression. Yeah. And again, just as a recap, what did you think of the Barbarian Brothers personality-wise in that movie? They were fun. They were infectious. They were goofy guys, and they looked and acted a little different than what we see. Maybe not so much acted, but they looked radically different than what we see here. That was where they had the shorter hair and the beards and kind of looked more like Lou Ferrigno at the time. Yeah, and this is they're very much going for that Fabio, long hair, clean-shaven look that was popular in the 80s. Leading us off, this was a Canon Films production. How familiar are you with Canon Films? I'm not an expert. I haven't seen that many of their films, but they're pretty infamous. I know enough about film history to know their role in films like Superman 4, the Death Wish films, Masters of the Universe. Every ninja movie. Yeah, the American Ninjas. Life Force. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Basically, they're known for schlock. Yes. And surprisingly enough, this doesn't deviate too far from that. Right. What's interesting about this one, this one was largely an Italian production, but it does seem as though Golan and Globus, who were the founders of Canon, it does seem like they were involved. The writer, who I'll get to in a second, is one of their regular screenwriters. Otherwise, I don't really know much else. You and I had talked outside the show. I think it's worth recommending to people if you want to learn more about Canon Films. Go and check out the documentary Electric Boogaloo, the story of Canon Films. Yes. If you're not familiar with Canon, that is a great place to start. It shows you some of the insanity that they were doing on those movies. And if you've ever heard the term Electric Boogaloo applied to a sequel, that's because they are the studio that produced Break Into Electric Boogaloo. Yes. The Barbarians was written by James R. Silk. That's silk with an E at the end, though I don't believe it's pronounced silky. I think it is just silk. Who at the time was a regular writer at Canon Films. He wrote Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3 The Domination, American Ninja, Sahara, and King Solomon's Mines. All classics. Yeah, and pretty much all of those except for Barbarian seems to have gotten mentioned in the documentary. Yeah. Again, go check that one out. There is a surprising lack of the Barbarians in that documentary, to its detriment. Yes. Maybe. We'll see. Maybe the sequel. Ah, the Barbarians was actually his last screenplay. James R. Silk, more commonly under the name Jim Silk, has since gone on to become a rather prolific and prominent pinup artist. And does Betty Page style pinup sketches and even did his own pinup comic series Rascals in Paradise for Dark Horse back in the 90s. Yeah, you would mentioned that to me outside of the show to mm -hmm. look up some of his stuff. I mean, it's very much classic pinup art. Mm -hmm. I think he did a story for the uh, Rocketeer comic revival. Might be. I know that there was a few stories that I got from right around that time. He doesn't really branch out that much. No, it's very much pinup art. <laughs> he wrote a bunch of exploitation movies and then draws boobs all day. So, Jim Silk. There's worse lives to live. And they are very lovely boobs. Yes. <laughs> Lovingly drawn. <laughs> the director of the film, Ruggiero Diodato. Had you ever heard of Ruggiero Diodato? I had to look him up. Once I saw what he's probably best known for, I was like, oh boy. Yeah, he was one of those Italian directors, came up out of the 60s, did a whole bunch of stuff, did crime dramas, Hercules movies, melodramas and comedies. Then he became notorious for two of the most controversial and outlawed movies of all time. The first of which, Cannibal Holocaust. That's the one I was thinking of. The film where he literally had to go to court to prove that he didn't kill his actors on camera. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> where he had to get the actors to appear in court, prove that they were really the people in the movie, and then showed how they did the effects. Yeah. It was three years before anyone let him make a film again, and then he followed that up with The House on the Edge of the Park, which is known as one of the most brutal and nasty of the Last House on the Left clones. Mm. Thugs break into a house and literally just rape and torture everybody for 90 minutes. Oh, that sounds delightful. Yeah. 
And then basically he just fell into cheap Italian slasher movies than this. Yeah, he did like five other movies after this, including The Washing Machine, about a killer washing machine. Wow. But The Barbarians was, I think, one of his last prominent films, or one of his last to get a wide release. Well, you know, I mean, we'll get into that. There's a case for that being both a tragedy and probably a sensible decision on filmmakers' part across the world. (laughs) You ready for me to throw in the synopsis? I think we're ready to give them the plot. All right. The Ragnicks are a caravan tribe of wandering nomads and seeming circus performers who are led by their queen, Canary. While crossing plains, they're suddenly attacked by the barbarous forces of the warlord Kadar. Half of the Ragnicks flee, taking with them the tribe's sacred ruby, the powers of which Kadar desires, while the rest of the tribe is brutally cut down or captured into slavery. When a pair of rowdy identical twin boys, Kuchek and Gore, attack Kadar and bite off several of his fingers, he's about to have them killed, but Canary pledges herself to Kadar's every whim if he'll spare their lives. He does so, locking Canary in a cage at the heart of his harem, as he hatches a devious plan for how to deal with the boys. Kuchek and Gore are separated, each believing the other to be dead, and spend several years bulking themselves up under the hormone-inducing hard labor of slavery, and every day each is tortured and taught to fight by a man in a distinct helmet whom each twin comes to loathe. The day of Kadar's great plan arrives when he has each twin don the helmet of the other's torturer and pits them against one another in a cage of combat. After all, Kadar promised not to kill them himself, but he never said anything about having them kill each other. During the vicious fight, the helmets come off and the brothers recognize one another, and hearing Canary cry out from above, they break loose with the hopes of returning to rescue her. By the way, this is only the first 20 minutes of the movie. Pardon me while I get a little more brisk. (laughs) Kuchek and Gore reunite with the remnants of the Ragnicks, who are hiding in the woods. There, they meet Ismena, a captured thief who promises to help the twins break back into the fortress to free their queen. The rest of the Ragnicks are reluctant to help because they're not fighters, despite carrying spears and fighting. (laughs) After misadventures involving an attempt to buy weapons which turns into an arm wrestling match, making donkey noises at topless women they see in a tent, and the two brothers making out to ward off a guard, Ismena leads into a secret tunnel which leads to the harem. Finding Canary, she surprisingly refuses to flee with the men, as Kadar's forces would follow, but she gives them instructions on how to recover the ruby, as it's the source of their tribe's power. After having sex with Kadar's harem, (laughs) Kuchek and Gore ride off with Ismena. First to the Lost Tomb, where they recover fabled weapons and fight off some beastmen. Then to the Forbidden Land, where the ruby is protected by a giant circumcised dragon. (laughs) We'll get there. This all runs parallel to a plot where Kadar's main sorceress, China, tortures Canary and runs off to get the ruby so she can rise to power, and the failed bodies of her and her men are found in the dragon's guts when the boys dig out the ruby. The boys leave, then return when Canary uses magic to force Kadar to kill her so she can no longer be used as a hostage, leading to a final standoff between Kadar and the barbarians he himself helped to forge. I'm sure I'm not spoiling anything when I say the heroes win. Shock. Returning to the Ragnicks, they need to choose a new queen and thus summon what few virgins remain among their young women to see who will be chosen by the ruby through the act of it sticking to their belly buttons. (laughs) None work, so in desperation they force Ismena to give it a go. It sticks, leading her to finally admit she's Kara, a young girl who was separated from the tribe during the attack all those years ago. With their barbarian brother heroes and their new queen, the Ragnicks ride off. So JD. Yes. Do you recommend the barbarians? I do. With a giant asterisk next to it. This is not a good film. The acting is wooden. The plot is nonsensical. There's almost nothing original in it. But there is a goofy charm that makes it enjoyable for me. I think a lot of people will probably be able to laugh alongside with it. And there's going to be people who are going to watch it and just be like, this is utter garbage. Why are you watching this? But for me, I had a lot of fun watching this. I thought it was great. What about you? I recommend it too. It's definitely rough around the edges. It's rowdy. It definitely is very 80s in terms of being a barbarian film that doesn't treat women particularly well. Nope. But it's actually not that badly made. The plot has a good setup. There's some really fun set pieces. Mm -hmm. I actually think the film is well shot with some really great sets and costume work. And the barbarian brothers are really, really fun to watch. (laughs) 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. And so, yeah, I enjoy it. I think, you know, again, it's more just a taste level thing. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a bit tasteless at times, but it's also still really charming and has a good winking energy to it and a good sense of adventure and humor and a giant penis dragon. And (laughs) there's something for everyone. Yeah. Be that barking at a wolf head or arm wrestling a giant. (laughs) Why don't we just go ahead and jump into the brothers themselves? Yeah. What did you think of that whole backstory that was given to them? You mean like them as kids? Yeah. And then being separated and tortured and then like forced to fight each other in the arena with the helmets of each other's torturer. I kind of like that because it almost feels like a fable or like a myth or some sort of story I may have read as a kid. It it feels like a classical parable that Robert E. Howard put a pulpy spin on. Right. Exactly. Exactly. The backstory was fine. It gave you what their motivation Mm -hmm. was and sets them up as far as like, I mean, it makes no sense that they would be this buff after X number of years that are not explained how long that is, but apparently no one ages except for them. It's all that protein from all the snakes they catch. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say they must be feeding them really well. (laughs) Yeah, that takes a lot of protein. Yeah, you don't get that if you're just getting gruel. It is an interesting setup how you have the whole opening build of the attack. And then the whole montage as you see these children being tortured gradually up into men. And then you see the brothers. And it's not really until 20 minutes into the movie when they're pitted against one another in the arena and they finally recognize each other that they have their first lines of dialogue. Yeah. They might have heard them scream at their torturers or something like that a couple yeah. times too. But they really don't get to speak right. to any extent until like after they've had this fight with each other. Right. But I got to say, I think they make a hell of an introduction because you not only during the montage, you, know, you see them getting tortured over the years and then suddenly you cut to one of the full-size barbarians as he just walks right up to the guy who usually whips him is just kind of like bring it (laughs) and then the whole fight in the arena i mean there's nothing particularly choreography wise about it but it still just has a lot of power a lot of energy just the way they're spreading their arms and waving the swords with those giant helmets on Mm mm-hmm I love how I love how many of the audience members get killed. Yeah. Or have their hands hacked off just by being too close to the cage. Yeah, when you see the hand get hacked off, that was where I was like, who is this film for? Because a lot of the humor like during the carriages being mm-hmm. attacked during the raid, it seems like that Italian exploitation genre. Where they push the violence just a little further than yeah. you expect it to go. Yeah, a little bit more than like say your average Conan film or whatever. Not a lot of blood, but definitely what happens is kind of hardcore. There's a brutality to it. Right. Then you get this scene where the hand gets hacked off and it's played for laughs. (laughs) And then the brothers are so out there and so goofy and very childish type of sense of humor. I'm just like, who is this aimed for exactly? Apparently it's aimed for you and me. Teenage boys. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say. The majority of Canon's films were aimed at teenage boys. Well, fair enough. They were the image comics of 80s exploitation studios. Yeah. And I do think this film very much could be like a poster child for canon in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's big, it's silly, it's fun. It's actually not that poorly made, but it's completely tasteless. Right. That's canon in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And then it's like you get that fun introduction and then the whole thing of slicing the helmets off and then they're like, why do you have my face? How dare you have my face? Kuchek, you idiot. It's me, your brother. Yeah. (laughs) One of the brothers seems to be played a slight hair more intelligent than the other one. The problem is that up until like the last third of the film. I don't know who's who at all. Yeah. The last third of the film, they do actually get costumes that are fairly distinct from each other. I still didn't pay attention. (laughs) Yeah. But by that point, I don't think they ever say like, hey, Gore, you're the one with the gold arm. Right. And I'm the one with the chest plate. You could tell them apart, but you still don't know who is who. (laughs) Right. Exactly. The only distinction is one is played slightly smarter than the other. Well, and one does the donkey laugh. But the problem is I couldn't even tell you if it is one person or both of them. You only ever see one of them do it at a time. Right. I just don't know which one was which. And I know it's twins. And I get that's an obvious statement, but they could have put a little effort to distinguish them a little bit. But I kind of love it that, yeah, there's one who's maybe a little bit smarter, but that's about it. And even then, just like a hair smarter. They're neither one of them are very intelligent. And that seems to be, at least I get the impression they're in on the joke. Yeah, they're Barbarian Brothers. Right. <laughs> they are the Barbarian Brothers playing Barbarian Brothers. Mm-hmm. You get what's on the tin. This is, you absolutely get what you're paying for. This. <laughs> you see that poster with the Barbarian Brothers as the Barbarian Brothers in Barbarians. Yep. Yep. 
But what I kind of love is also that once they escape, yeah, it's like, yeah, you get this whole serious, epic, grandiose, pulpy backstory. And then suddenly, you know, they're like Bulk and Skull joking off of each other. Once they escape, it's like that whole backstory of them like being separated and thinking the other was dead and being raised by these torturers is largely forgotten. Yeah. And is never really called back to. And I love the two just kind of settle right back into being bros and moving as a unit, you know? Yeah. Later on, they're like, I tell you, you keep always overdoing things. And you haven't seen him, say, for like maybe one day since, you know, escaped. And now you're like getting on his case. And I'm like, of course, because this is the Barbarian Brothers. And that right. I wouldn't expect it any other way. Right. And well, and, and it's, there is some weak shtick here and there, but it's still charming. Like you have the whole thing of like one barbarian has the sword and the other has the axe. And he goes like, no, you know, I don't want the axe. I want the sword. And then he gives the axe to the other brother and sees that the other brother's enjoying No, no, I want the axe back. Give me the axe back. Right. Like yeah. I said, it's very childish sense yeah. of humor. That's the type of thing that I think probably eight-year-old me would have loved. Yeah. But seeing it being these two guys doing it, yeah. it is still kind of funny and charming. Yeah, it's there's an infectious charm to them that you can't really hate them, no matter how goofy right. they are. And the thing about the Paul brothers is, I'm not going to call them great actors. No. But they are great personalities. I think that's entirely fair. They do have charisma. You, every time they're on screen, you are watching them. And it's not just looking at their muscles. You're actually watching what they're doing. They are reacting and paying attention attention and doing little bits of business and interacting with the environment and the people around them. They bounce off each other decently enough. They're expressive. They're energetic. They have a good physicality. They're not bad performers. And again, these guys had been doing a traveling stage act for, I want to say, like seven years by this point. Yeah, I mean, I kind of get the impression some of the scenes feel like they might have been like riffing or improvising just a little bit. Right. And some of those bits like, no, I want this. No, I want that. Feel like they could have come out of there. I mean, there's almost a slight vaudeville quality to them. Yeah. Not a good vaudeville. No. But it's entertaining vaudeville. Right. I keep thinking of the scene where like the werewolf shows up, mm -hmm. gets decapitated almost immediately. And they just start barking with the head. Yeah. And then they like pick up the head and just start like barking and howling with it. That feels like they were just on the set and they like, decided to mess with the actress who plays Kara slash whatever her other name was. He's man. There's a few moments where she looks like she's about ready to crack up. Oh yeah. That feels like it was just something that they did on set. Right. They're infectious and fun. I also love the arm wrestling scene where the one guy breaks out his poisonous snake. <laughs> Yes. And the brother just literally hisses at the snake and the snake goes away. <laughs> and it's so obviously a constructor type yeah. snake, which are non-poisonous, but you know, they- Shush, shush. These, and are, they, these are the primal eras. And so clearly being held up by people off screen. This is the snakes of the high boring in age. Come on. That's, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But I don't care because it's just so goofy and so fun. It's a very in the moment movie. Yeah. And that's, I think, the best copy you give the twins is they're always in the moment. Mm -hmm. There's never any particular thinking about their past or contemplating the future or having any kind of deep insider conversations. No, they're just kind of barreling through everything very in the moment and just having fun. There's the whole scene where, you know, the guard is coming and one brother just pulls the other brother into a kiss. Yeah. It was a legitimately funny scene as, you know, they don't comment on it. They just spit and walk away. <laughs> yeah. And if it was any other movie, I would be like, eh, okay, I could have lived without this whole spitting gay panic type of reaction. But because it's their brothers. It's incest. You can kind of go, <laughs> okay, they needed to do it to hide. And then, yeah, it's gross because it's incest. They are fun. And you have to admit. Their bodies are really interesting physiques. I mean, they are impressively honed musculatures. I don't even think like in the heyday of Arnold or Sly, that muscle-bound action hero, there's very few who reached that level. And again, these guys reached it in a very short period of time. Right. Because they just dove into it. <laughs> yeah. Even Arnold in his heyday, he was big, but he still had some slimness to him. These guys were just going for pure mass. Well, that's because he was a competitive bodybuilder where it was more about the look of the physique. Right. And that's where you want trim waists and have wide spots and narrow spots. And again, that's not what interested these guys. These guys are power lifters. These guys are, we lift for the sake of lifting. Mm -hmm. You know, like they lift paper mache rocks and sleeping women. <laughs> I do love that bit where they just need to get this one sleeping woman off of a chest full of stuff. So they literally just pick her up and she's like just holding her position. <laughs> and they turn around two minutes later and find out that the brother's still holding. 
Yeah. Put her down. <laughs> and he does look like he's not at all like bothered by holding this woman. At, like he could keep doing that all day. Yeah. They do that well. I know we get to see one of them pick up a giant actual rock during the opening montage. Mm -hmm. What's funny is we never get like their token weightlifting scene. Kind of like how, you know, all the Tarzan movies starring Johnny Weissmuller, who was an Olympic swimmer. Well, we got to have him swim at least once a movie. <laughs> we do get the arm wrestling. That's close enough. Yeah. Was this before or after Over the Top? Same year. Which was also a canon film directed yeah. by Menahem Golan. <laughs> See, I think they were trying to build into, like, this is going to be the new big tense action set piece. The arm wrestling scene. And then they all got outdone by David Cronenberg's The Fly. Oh, that's, yeah. That is a completely different... Oh, snap. <laughs> oh. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, I really don't have anything to respond to that other than just moan and move on. Shifting over into some of the other cast, what did you think of the main villain, Richard Lynch's Kadar? It's weird. He's not a great villain. I don't blame his performance per se. To be honest, he's trying to have fun as much as the Barbarian Brothers are. Like the scene where we really first see him confront the Ragnicks. And he's just taunting the women, yeah. And he's just swinging the sword around wildly like a little child with a cardboard tube. And looks about as threatening. But he, then he like pauses and laughs every time he swings it. This is an actor who clearly understands what the material is and is just trying to have fun with it. Mm -hmm. The problem is that like his character, there's just nothing there. And unlike the brothers where we get to spend a lot of time with them, he's there at the beginning and he's there at the end. And for the most part, he's just leering at Canary and not really doing a whole lot. This entire script is a pretty thinly constructed story, mm -hmm. especially him. There's no history. There's no why, there's no what is he searching for, what is this quest, other than he wants to get this ruby, but we never really see the ruby do anything but stick to a belly button. Right. I know Canary summons some of the magic powers when she kills herself, but we never really get the whole history between Kadar. I mean, they have this weird voiceover montage, but it feels like it's describing a story that's not really what we're seeing on film. The ruby contains the secret of music, joyful laughter, and human kindness. Which, you know, every supervillain wants those things. So they can keep it from the masses. I, I yeah, it's <laughs> like if they had gone into that and said like, oh, well, we could oxygen this off to a kingdom and that way they would be the most happy kingdom in the realm. But he doesn't do that. Right. He wants the ruby. And even then, he doesn't seem too concerned of his sorceress who really wants that. He just seems to be more hung up on a canary and yeah. loving her. And she won't love him back because he's a rapey creep who rapes. Right. And kind of winding back a few threads there. What's interesting about the whole backstory even is the whole Ragnicks. They're this kingdom chosen by this stone and this power. And the lands are always meant to be open for them. It's like they're a traveling circus. That's all we're seeing on screen is they're a traveling circus. And we never even get to see them perform as a circus. No. They're just a traveling circus. Well, you see like juggling or doing knife throwing while they're going through. But it would have been cool is like if the jewel contains the power of joy and happiness and laughter to at least have a scene where we see the circus bringing this joy to the masses. Oh, yeah. And then Kadar feeling threatened by that because people willingly go to see that, but they avoid coming to him unless he has soldiers dragged them to him yeah he's envious of the allure of this thing that he doesn't have i can kind of get that but it's not conveyed right it wouldn't have taken a lot of work to get to that point the problem is they didn't put any effort into like right. it's just a MacGuffin. it's just something that the script says they need and so that's what they're going after and then they just made him a token bad guy and honestly the only benefit is that he's played by richard lynch and richard lynch a very good actor He's kind of like somewhere between Christopher Walken and Rucker Howard. Mm -hmm. Richard Lynch always has that distinctive look because he was badly burned at one point in his time. So that's why he has this kind of rugged looking skin. He was in a ton of stuff in the 70s and 80s. Played a lot of villains like this. But again, he has charisma. He brings a lot of other things. I mean, like we mentioned, the playing with the sword. But I also love bits where he'll just walk over and sit down somewhere. But he won't just sit down. He'll prop up a leg and sit down in a pensive looking pose. Or his whole thing of having the throne on top of the giant wooden wheel held up by slaves. Yeah. It's just so ridiculous. I agree. Like, he could have been a really good villain, I think. I don't blame the actor. They play it right. There's just nothing to build on that. Right. He's not given anything to do. Right. And actually, his fight scene towards the end with the brothers is actually kind of well done. <laughs> it's just by that point, it feels like you're wrapping things up. 
I'll be honest, most of the fight scenes in this didn't really feel that choreographed. No. They were just kind of swinging at people. No, but I think it was one of the better planned. To be fair, that's what it would probably feel like if you both had axes and were swinging at each other. Yeah. I think there was a slight bit more effort to plan out that fight than the arena battle. And there was interesting stuff like he had the reflective shield, the whole bit where he would pause his horse with his back to them and wait for them to come closer. And then like lean back and have two knives. He had strategy. Yeah. Like I said, it's a little bit better done than the other fights. Not a lot. None of these fights are great. No. Or none of them are actually what I consider good, to be honest, even for this era. Not <laughs> terrible, but yeah, they're not good. The problem is, is, like I said, they just don't have anything for him to do. He's just the bad guy because the plot says we need a bad guy. They don't put any more effort into it than that. And even the whole thing with his sorceress, China, trying to operate behind his back and overtake the throne by getting the ruby herself. It's like, that's barely even mentioned. Yeah. It's kind of there, but again, they don't really explore it. They don't really show any tension between him and China. She doesn't always obey his rules, but you don't get this sense of they're operating at odds. When we first meet her, like she takes the fingers that the kids bit off from Kadar's hand. And she's like, somebody could use these to attack you with the right magic or whatever. So you need to burn these and scatter the ashes. He's like, go ahead and do it. And you see like cloud smoke pop out of her hand and that's the end of it. And like those fingers are coming back and she's going to use them against him at some key moment. Nope. And they never do. That would be the perfect like, okay, these are two villains. They don't entirely trust each other. There's going to be some sort of back. No, he barely learns of her treachery until like after she's dead. China was a fun character to watch because the actress really got into it. I love some of the things she did with her magic power gestures and how she waved her hands around. She seemed like an interesting character, but she's just buried in the background for most of it. And then she yeah. has this whole other subplot that they just breeze through quick. And then you don't even see her die. It's just, oh, yeah, then they find her in the belly of the dragon. Mm -hmm. Jim Silk, I've actually seen a lot of the films he's on. I've actually read one of his screenplays. I actually have the screenplay for Revenge of the Ninja. He's not a very good screenwriter. I am shocked. Shocked. He's not terrible, but he's kind of one of those writers who it's a decent enough first draft that you wish you'd have a few other writers come in and build off of. Mm -hmm. There's ideas here. There's nice set pieces and nice specific sequences here. Nice ideas for characters here, but it's like he hasn't really fleshed any of it out. He hasn't really worked out the connective tissue. I mean, like the whole thing of we need to go free Canary, but no, Canary's going to stay there and she's going to tell us to go and find these sacred weapons that'll allow you to go slay the dragon and win the jewel, despite the fact that we actually send someone to bring the jewel back to the dragon the plot does not hold together no but it's not like annoyingly not holding together because it's one of those films that as you're watching it you're like this is stupid but it's fun and you just kind of go with it mm -hmm. no it's one of those films that you know what you're getting into in the first five minutes if you're not walking away by that point, you're probably at least have an idea of what's going to happen and you're probably going to go along with the ride. Yeah. If you get through the whole opening intro, you're going to be along for the ride. Absolutely. Especially once you get up to the barbarians. Right. And I must say this film, I have watched it with friends. If you do like movie night parties with friends, this is a good film for that. Yeah, I kind of wish I had shown this to some friends because I think we could have a really good laugh alongside this. Mm-hmm. Leading into Canary, again, good performance, interesting character, but again, her whole history is largely unknown. She's later mm -hmm. able to tap into this magic that we don't see her use earlier on. Why she's willing to throw the dignity of herself and her kingdom away just to protect these two kids by literally selling herself into sexual slavery in this guy's harem. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. There's that line that Kadar asked, are they magic? And she's like, no, they're just orphans. And like, that's just a weird question to ask in general. But you've lost so many other people. And I understand not wanting to have anyone killed. But why didn't she say like, hey, I'll go with you if you let all my people go. But she doesn't. She just wants to save those two. Right. Especially given how many of her people actually did get away. Right. And do you think there's any symbolism behind the caged person being named Canary? Uh, I don't. <laughs> think so. I'm pretty sure that's just a coincidence. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, it's not very subtle. She's the pretty bird who he wants and can't have because she will never be truly free until she's dead. 
And they get into the whole thing of, you may have my body, but you don't have my respect. Right. I'm glad we never see any of the rapiness on screen. Yeah, I mean, he kind of starts at one point and it gets interrupted. I mean, it's pretty obvious that that's happened between them. Right. There's the whole opening scene where they come in with all these captive people and he says, the women are yours to the men and the women are dragged into the pleasure rooms. Right. And then, of course, they're just the harem itself. Right. And we're even told that he ignores the rest of his harem just for her. So, like, you know what's going on. I'm glad they don't really explore that any more on screen than they do. I mean, it doesn't really need to be there to begin with, but I'm glad they don't explore it any more on screen than they do. Right. Especially surprising that this is a Golan and Globus movie. Yeah, I was going to say, if this was like any other film company, there might be some slight implications, but they could have easily gone there. Golan and Globus will usually just straight up show it. Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, let's remember Death Wish 3. Yeah, let's not. And that's where, again, I wonder how much of a creative hand they had in this and how much of it was more the Italian company. But it's there. And I'll be honest, this is where a friend of mine and me, we were thinking, hey, let's go back and explore the 80s barbarian movies. And we started with Conan the Barbarian. It's a fun movie, except for that part where Slave Conan rapes a slave girl as a prize. And then we followed it with this. And I think we then started watching one other and we were like, you know what? I think I could see why the 80s barbarian movies had their place and their time, but it's so much rape. So much rape. Yeah. Especially if you're getting into like the new world stuff. Yeah. Corman films go really far in that department. It's weird because you've probably read a lot more Howard than I did. How much of that was in those stories? Howard is interesting. and I mean, it's very much a world where that happens, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't really expressly explore it. And what's fascinating about Howard is his Conan in the actual pulps is actually very respectful of women. I mean, there's a great Conan story where it's Conan and this one virgin priestess are stranded on an island after they escape from a boat. Conan, you know, is sitting across from her at the campfire and she's getting a little nervous because she's never been alone with a man like this before. And he just straight up says, basically, I think you're hot. If you want to do it, we'll do it. If you don't want to do it, I'll leave you alone. Conan doesn't take women. (laughs) And then they just leave it at that. And what's interesting is even as the story goes on, a bond does form between them, but it's legitimately more of a friendship bond. Because again, he's the world traveler, but she's also a scholar. So she's the one who figures out how to map the island, how to chart where they are on the world, how to try to figure out how to get off this island and go back where they're going. And he's supporting her the entire way saying like, I don't know how to read. Go for it. (laughs) The Conan stories are fascinating in that they do have some dated stereotypes of their time, especially in terms of ethnic portrayals. But they're also surprisingly progressive because he'll describe, you know, an ebony Nubian But that character will also be someone that Conan sees as a friend and equal, someone he looks up to. The Conan stories are not really that rapey. Yeah. I think the thing is, the Frazetta paintings, in their nudity and just the weird dynamic poses and all that stuff, brought a sexuality that went even further than the books. Not that the stories didn't occasionally have their sexuality. But I mean, like, a lot of Conan's relationships were like, yeah, he became the husband of the pirate queen, Mm -hmm. who is, like, one of the most feared swashbucklers on the seven seas. Conan falls for people who he considers to be equals. Or is just like, hey, you're hot. You want to do it? If you don't, that's fine. Let's move on. Yeah. He speaks his mind, but he also respects the other person's wishes. I think you're right about the Frazetta stuff. And I think also it's just that this era, there was a lot of schlocky... When you have to remember the big thing that came out of the 70s resurgence of sword and sorcery... Because, you know, all that stuff suddenly became reprinted in the 70s. That's where you got the Frazetta covers. That's where you got the paperbacks. That's where El Sprague Comp and Lynn Carter started expanding on the Conans. But this has also created this whole resurgence of sword and sorcery, which led to gore. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with the gore novels. No. That's a fantasy world that's literally built around the slavery and subjugation of women and how secretly all women desire to be dominated by men. Oh, lovely. And that's a novel series that ran for dozens and dozens of books and continues to be self-published by the author to this day and was made into two movies by New World. Makes sense. And of course, you know, the 80s became the very macho power fantasy era. Mm -hmm. Even just a lot of the general action movies had a lot of rape, a lot of violence towards and subjugation of women. Yeah. Again, we even saw that crossover into the comics as comics started to become edgier and more quote unquote mature and extreme. Right. Especially like throughout the 80s and then leading into the 90s. 
Yeah, as the 90s came in, PC culture became more of a thing. And I think it kind of backed away from some of that. But I think 70s and 80s were starting to push content a lot more. Even Star Wars fell into that with the whole slave Leia. Right. Like I said, part of it is just like that era was just prime for that sort of thing. And they played into the fantasy of the enslavement and subjugation of women. Right. Who will meet your every desire, you know, that kind of thing. So you're saying Canary is a great, well-rounded character who really, we couldn't add anything more to her mythos. I actually really love the scene where she sees the boys for the first time all grown up. Yeah. And she's even like, you guys are so big. (laughs) And not in like an insinuation way. She's just literally like, dear Lord, are you guys large? (laughs) Right. And I love how it kind of sweet it is. Yeah. And then they have sex with the entire harem in front of her. <laughs> yeah. Because it was treated like, oh, this is reuniting with mom, essentially. Like, if mom had aged 10 to 20 years, you right. know, however long. Because they were 30 when they made this film. But let's pretend like they were 18 or something like that. So it was somewhere oh, yeah. between like 8 and 10 years, probably. No, I think they're about 12 by this point. They just use very strong hormones. Well, fair enough. It's only been two years. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> No one else is aged except for them and Ismina. Right. I mean, hell, Amidala's still got his headdress. Yeah. But they treat it like reuniting with mom. And so like there's this very touching reconnection. And then they go into like presumably having sex. And then they just gangbang the harem. Yeah. 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 And it's this whole weird scene of, you know, they're breaking in to see her. And it's like as they're passing the sprawling naked sleeping woman. You have one of the brothers slowly trying to mount this unconscious woman. Yeah. And the other brother like pushing him off. And so he just goes and covers her up with a blanket. But then it's like as they're saying goodbye to Canary and leaving, he's like, oh, I just want to look under the blanket one more time. And as he does, the woman wakes up, instantly throws herself at him. And suddenly all the women are throwing themselves at the two brothers. And yeah, they pretty much left with the whole harem. Yeah. Which, at least that's consensual. But there's still women who have been living in sexual slavery for... Yeah. It's very obviously written by a guy for guys. Yeah. You know, for teenage boys, as you said. It's the one part I really wish... If I had to cut anything out, I would cut that part out. Right. The one joke that I do like that comes from it, we cut to them literally just covered in a blanket of women... To Ismena sleeping out in an alley just surrounded by these stinky dudes, literally just in a pile of people who are just all drunk and sleeping and just miserable. Mm -hmm. And then she sees the two brothers who are, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. The joke was okay. (laughs) It was just such an 80s canon film sequence. Yeah. Kind of leading into Ismena, I do actually like that there's not really a romance between her or any of the brothers. No, she's treated like a sister. Yeah, they become a team. Mm -hmm. What do you think about her as a broader character? She was better than most of the other characters that weren't the brothers. She did have a bit of an arc, at least. Not a lot. But we're scraping to find anything interesting with these characters other than just pure charisma. Mm -hmm. Eva LaRue has actually gone on to do quite a bit of acting over the years. And this was one of her first, yeah. Yeah, the thing that she might be most recognizable was she was on CSI Miami for like 152 episodes. She's done like Ghoulies 3, RoboCop 3... Lakeview Terrace. Part three? No. As far as I know, it's just the original Lakeview Terrace. I don't know if there is a three yet, but if Ken was still around, there would be. I just want to believe that the Lakeview Terrace sequels, they just built another terrace upon the terrace. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this multi-story terrace. Yes. Now we can see the whole lake. Yeah. Sam Jackson's just still really angry. So um, she actually seems like she's having fun. Mm-hmm. Kind of like how the brothers are. And in fact, most of her scenes are with the brothers. Probably helps with that. And she's not really treated like a sex object for the most no. part. I mean, there is the scene where like... They almost sell her for weapons. Yeah. Yeah. That part is not so fun. But the rest of the film, she's just treated as part of the team. Yeah. They are literally the brothers and the sister. Right. It's Yakko, Wacko, and Dot. <laughs> and she's actually smarter than them. Right, because they spent their entire young adult lives locked in cages, so she actually knows the area, she knows the back alleys, the secret passages, she knows the connections, who's who. She's the street smarts. Right. And she's also the one who comes up to how they right. kill the dragon. She's the street smarts, and she's the book smarts, mm-hmm. and they're the barbarians. Yeah, they're the muscle. I was always waiting for the scene where she tries to run away and leave them behind. But they never do that. I kind of like that they play that tension or she might at some point, especially when they give her the jewel. But it's like we never really believe that she will. Right. One thing that really did confuse me is the whole Kara thing. They blew that reveal. Yeah. Repeatedly. 
it doesn't make any sense to me. She never acknowledges it up until the very end of the film when she has no particular reason to have been hiding it. The brothers call her out on it like halfway through the film. It's when they give her the ruby and they're like, by the way, we trust you, Kara. And she's like, Kara? Yeah, they know who she is and keep throwing that at her. But it's like she just doesn't acknowledge it. But then they still treat it like a big reveal at the end. Right. It just doesn't make any sense. I gotta think that this was something that read differently either on the page right. or was edited weird or something. And it's like she is in the opening scene. There is the little girl too. But it's like they don't really build on that relationship between the boys and the little girl in that sequence. Yeah. But I still, I like the performance. I like the personality of the character. She is fun and snarky and holds her own in the fight. Again, she's the smart one of the group. She's the Mm -hmm. witty one of the group, too. Yeah, she gets a couple lines in that made me chuckle. Yeah. So getting into when they find the people in the woods, I make a joke, but that dude is totally cosplaying Abadala. (laughs) The weird mystic. Yeah. He's got an interesting look to him. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it's literally the big U-shaped Amidala headdress, Mm -hmm. white face paint, the robes. It's a very homemade cosplay, but you know, A for effort. Mm-hmm. He's a really interesting looking guy too. Yeah. I kept expecting him to be like a mime because he doesn't say anything during that original cart chase and he's got the white makeup on. And then when he actually starts speaking, I'm like, oh, this is like halfway through the film by this point. And he's got that weird, like long face. He's right. definitely one that stands out as far as his pure appearance. Right. And it should be pointed out, he is an Italian actor who is dubbed. Mm-hmm. What's interesting is you almost expect him to kind of be the comic relief. And he kind of is in the opening sequence where, you know, they're being chased and they're running out of weapons and they're running out of soldiers on the cars to defend. So he literally just throws his crystal ball and it explodes. And even he's like, I didn't expect that to happen. Right. Yeah, that's another one I was like, I don't understand, like, did he intend for that to happen? Did he think it might not work? It's a fun moment. Go with it. Yeah, I know. (laughs) I'm overthinking it. But then what's funny is that when you then get to the camp, he's become the leader of the group. Right. He and his wife, uh, Lura. And I'm actually looking at him. He is actually still a very prominent Italian character actor. Still has that very distinctive look and does play very similar visual roles. Kind of like a a Doug Jones type. Mm Mm-hmm. I did have to laugh, though, when the barbarians meet up with them again for the first time after however many years. They're like, we need weapons. Well, we don't have any weapons to give you. And he's literally got like a weapon on his belt. They're all holding spears, spears. which they used to capture the barbarians. In the first place. I mean, they could have said like, hey, we need better weapons or we something. soldiers. Yeah. I'm like, turn off your brain, JD. It right. doesn't make sense. And it's like every time we see them, we do have the one little person in the clown outfit. But then they have like one scene where every time the mystic talks, the, the little person has to repeat whatever he's saying. Yeah. I'm glad they didn't do that throughout the entire movie. Even then, like the little person is upset when Azmina is proven to be the new queen. And he's like, oh, well, that's building on the joke where he was laughing at everyone again. That's actually something, okay, as ridiculous as it is that they shall find their new queen by seeing to whom's navel the jewels (laughs) stick. I genuinely love the honest mirth with which they play the line, quick, bring the virgins. (laughs) And then the way that these very eager and excited young women are stepping forward and every time one of them is denied, they're like, oh, 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 no, and run off sobbing. Yeah. These women have lived their entire lives hoping to have their belly button clutched by the ruling ruby. (laughs) I, and they have been denied. Well, and I love the fact that when they actually like say, grab him, Smina, well, let's see if it works on her. She's like, I'm no virgin. No time for subtleties, my dear. I'm yeah. like, I don't understand what that means. I'm guessing maybe there were some rules added over time that don't actually fit the official rules. Yeah. I mean, has he ever tried his own belly button? It might work. I... T- Yeah, who knows? Again, being a canon film, I'm surprised it wasn't like a nipple pasty. (laughs) Yeah. But again, it's like even the whole like burying the bellies and which one's going to have it stick into them. It's played for laughs. It's not played in a very sexual exploitative way. No. It's silly. It is ridiculous. Mm Mm-hmm. And then getting into some of their adventures, we have the whole recovering the weapons with the beast men that attack. What did you think about that sequence? That was weird. They have the scene where you have the thing-like hands. Yeah, the arms are just coming out of the ground. Yeah, like, okay, that's kind of creepy. And then they just throw it on the ground and it's like they're done with it. See, the implication I got was the Barbarian Brothers, by grabbing the arm, were literally ripping it off of something. (laughs) Because then you see all the bloody viscera at the end. Yeah, you're probably right. And then it's like followed up with the werewolf who literally howls, gets shot with an arrow, jumps down, and is decapitated. 
That is not an action scene. That is like, I think the only reason they did it is the guys were like, hey, wouldn't it be funny if we howled like a wolf holding the head up in our hands and just pretending like it's howling? It's silly. He's got the howling wolf head in his hands. None of these action scenes make a whole lot of sense or are very good. Speaking of, what did you think about the erect dragon? Um, With those expressive eyebrows. It is very much very phallic. I will say... For a film that probably cost like 50 bucks to make, the dragon doesn't look terrible as far as like the way it was matted against the screen. It's not a bad set piece, no. Yeah. There's definitely parts of it that are super fake, but the puppet itself, they could have just designed that head better. Especially those eyes. Those eyes are just so silly. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Almost cartoony. I mean, we joke about the penile nature of the design, but it is an interesting concept how it's like a tube worm. Yeah. You know, how it's like this tube-like shell and then the fleshy head emerges. Mm -hmm. I'm trying not to be euphemistic here, but I know know what you mean. It it is a visual euphemism. But I do love this strategy where Ismena will lure the creature over a hole that the brothers are hiding in, and then they'll kill it. And I love the visual of these two brothers just hacking up into the creature's belly as all this gore and viscera is just pouring down on them. It is funny. Yeah. For a film that clearly didn't have the budget, even for that time, to do something like this, they did what they could, about as well as you could imagine. Oh, yeah. It's all about what you do with the resources you have. And I I don't think they do a bad job with the resources that they had here. No. Again, like, even just going down to the basics of the sets and costumes, this is some really impressive work. Yeah. Especially for, like, a low-budget barbarian film. Like, that arm pauldron or whatever it is that the one brother has actually looks really cool. Like, that's something that actually looks like it actually has, like, individual scales. And again, that's probably a prop that was left over from one of the Hercules movies because they were making those up into the 70s in the same studio. Right. I could imagine that a lot of this stuff was probably leftovers. Oh, yeah. The Italians reuse their stuff all the time to good effect. Right. If you got a great piece of costume here, why not? Mm hmm. And you can kind of tell, like, Ismina's got the armor, the chainmail yeah. on, that it fits her in the sense that it's not like it looks frumpy or anything, but it's not clearly designed to go around her. Yeah. It's not something that's tailored for her. Right. It's just something that looks like it just hangs on front of her, you know, which mm-hmm. doesn't need to do a whole lot more unless somebody attacks her from the side, because it's just basically a tunic. You know, people need to get over the whole thing about armor, because most people only wore light armor in specific spots, because it weighed you down. Hmm. Fair enough. I mean, at least she's not in a red Sonya bikini. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Because they were probably shooting that on the lot next door. (laughs) But yeah, there's a lot of fun to be had in this. And again, you have the whole bar where they're going to meet the weapons dealer. And I love how they just walk up to this one-eyed guy and are like, hey, nice eye. Can you show us where the weapons dealer is? And he just is looking at them like, okay. (laughs) Over. That's another one that just feels like one of the guys was like, I'll just yeah. improvise this about the eye. And I think they do a lovely job of filming the dancer on the stage. Mm-hmm. Again, there's the great smoky atmosphere of everything. I even love the bit where it's like they're going to go and break through the gate, but then they open the gate as they run through and they all tumble. And then this one drunken guard looks up and goes, hey, I was there. And, and I think they're just like, oh, we're just here to join the party. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you want to bring up? No, I think we've covered the big beats of this. I mean, the score is not very good, but it's not that intrusive. No. Not like a big epic Conan score. It's a bit of that Casio low-budget score. Oh, there's one thing I did want to mention. Like, in that opening scene at the Mm -hmm. beginning with the carts, those were actual people falling off horses. Oh, yeah. Say what you will about the budget, and it clearly didn't have a budget. They actually got real people, and at least in one scene, like, the horses get knocked down, too. Right. By that point, horses were actually trained to know how to tuck and roll. Right. That was something that really came up out of the 60s, was to not kill horses by tripping them. Yeah. Granted, this is an Italian production. I don't know what they were doing there. Yeah, I was going to say, but still, like, it is an impressive piece of, like... There is an actual person falling between these two horses because he got killed and he grabs the two horses and then just falls in between them. Yeah. That was a dangerous stunt. I think today, like, there was no way they would do that without, like, oh, CGI. Yeah. And honestly, I think we're at a time when that's not a bad thing. No, I don't think that it is. But there is something to be said. Oh, yeah. There is a part of me that just really loves the fact that people were really doing that. And I know some people got hurt and some people got killed and they probably don't need to do that anymore. But it's still impressive. 
I mean, like, we're even to this day having, like, stunt people dying on Deadpool. And it's like, you know, yeah, there's only so far I'm willing to go for a stunt these days. Right. And it sucks whenever anyone does get seriously hurt or especially if they get killed. Like, that's just terrible. But to build on what you're saying, though, I actually find that opening sequence to be... I mean, again, it's a little too gory and a little too brutal to be, quote unquote, fun. Yeah. But it is a really rousing and exciting sequence as this whole weird caravan of people are suddenly beset by... And we haven't mentioned them, but we have like all these weird villains, like the one guy who has all the metal plating glued onto his face. And, yeah. And we never mentioned Michael Berryman as the weird guy who tortures and trains the kids. Mm-hmm. The guy who just has the single horn on his forehead. The mutant from uh, The Hills Have the Eyes. The Hills Have Eyes, yeah. But I mean, yeah, the whole opening sequence where it's this whole circus character and having to fight off raiders. And so the knife tosser is tossing knives. The fire breather is breathing fire. And then what was weird was you had that whole scene where they open up this giant crossbow and load up this bolt and you're expecting, okay, which of the villains are they going to shoot off their horse? And he goes and shoots the spear and it just plunks down into the ground. You're like, what? You didn't hit anything, but they're celebrating. And then the spear suddenly springs out these two prongs, which trip up the horses of multiple riders. That is a weirdly convoluted weapon. Yeah. And it doesn't look like they had a second shot. The physics of that, I didn't quite understand how that worked. Wouldn't it just be easier to, like, shoot a net? (laughs) Another thing that made me laugh during that whole sequence, though, is there's, like, one cart that is just full of dry grass. I'm like, why do they need a kindling cart? Because, of course, like, somebody comes up and throws a torch into it and starts a fire. I'm thinking that's the hay to feed the horses, despite the fact that you're in plains full of grass. Right. Well, and depending on where they're going, they might need it, I guess. So that was a genuinely impressive action sequence that probably shouldn't be done today. But in the context of its time, it was still impressive. It was a nice way to open the movie. Yeah. And then we end the movie with a pop song. Yeah. I wasn't really able to find out any info about that. And the song wasn't really that memorable. No. It's not exactly Irene Cara. No, no. Let's see. Ruby Dawn, written by Pino Donaggio, lyrics by Paolo Stefan, and performed by Ronnie Jackson. (laughs) So it's obviously the Italian crew making their version of a pop song. That was where we get the call back to them. Like, I want the reins. You take the crop. No, you take the crop. I want the reins. Good. I like the reins better. It's a dumb joke, but it goes back to that. There is something genuinely charming with these two brothers. Yeah. So overall, it's not a bad feature showcase for the brothers. It's not a badly made 80s barbarian movie. And it's a perfect encapsulation of what makes the Barbarian Brothers the Barbarian Brothers. Mm -hmm. Cheesy humor and dear God, look at these men. (laughs) It's definitely gotten me excited for doing this series. Like, I remember watching Double Trouble 20 years ago, if not more. And I honestly don't remember that much about it, but I remember liking them well enough. And I liked them when we covered DC Cab, but I wasn't sure like, okay, can they actually hold a movie? And I think they do. Like, they're never going to be great actors. You're never going to want to put them in an actual drama. Right. At least not based on what they're doing here. I mean, maybe they've grown in the recent years. Maybe they could do something, but... Based on what we've seen, no, they're not great actors, but they do have charisma. They do have charm. And it is fun to watch them. And I want to see more of what they do. So I'm glad to be a part of this ride with you, my friend. Yeah. My brother. And same here. When you want basically like a modern version of the classic Steve Reeves Hercules movies, where Hercules had no real character or personality, he had no real backstory or history, nothing particularly deep or intellectual. He was a big, strong guy who swooped in, punched people, and saved the day. <laughs> they work. Yeah. They work in that type of old school pulp hero lead. You know, there's nothing particularly interesting about these characters, but damn, are they appealing to watch. <laughs> Exactly. I think he said it perfectly. Again, yeah, Barbarians, just look at the poster. And if that looks at all amusing or interesting to you, yep, that's what the film is going to be. It is what they're selling. Well, I think that kind of ends things for this episode. We'll be back to discuss Think Big, which I have no clue what it's about. But based on this film, I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be curious because I know they're big, but I I have yet to see them think. So They're expanding their horizons. They're expanding their horizons to match the expansion of their chest lines. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Say goodnight, Noel. Good night. 
Our Brilliance is a part of Schumacast, which can be found at schumacast.blogspot.com and on Stitcher. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. The music in this episode is Stars by Jack Locke and is used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Barbarians and Schumacast are in no way affiliated with the creators and copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Originally what happened is Missouri founded Kansas City on the Kansas River uh, and it became a big city. And so Kansas was like, hey, we want our own Kansas City too and we'll just build it on the other side of the river essentially. Oh, you have your own Minneapolis and St. Paul. That's adorable. Yeah. <laughs> so The rival twin cities. Yeah, except by that point, Missouri was well established and so their city is definitely the bigger of the two. Like Kansas City, Kansas is kind of considered... Um, I just had a thought. Hmm. A historical comedy about the mutual foundings of the various Kansas cities starring the Barbarian Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> One on each side of the river. No, you take Missouri. I don't want the Kansas anymore. I don't like Misery. Misery is sad. <laughs> she broke his ankle. Who does that? <laughs> well, why do you need to call yours Kansas? You're already Kansas. It's redundant. What does redundant mean? Stop making up words. <laughs> oh. See, I was just thinking like, oh, like a comedy about the forming of the two Kansas cities. See, no, no. Now I'm thinking of it as actually let's do a stage play where one is on one side of the river and the other's on the other side of the river. And that's just 90 minutes of them heckling each other. <laughs> I would totally watch that stage play. With diagrams. 